Uprising is a standalone booster set for flesh and blood that plunges fans into a brutal civil war sweeping across the harsh and unforgiving land of Volcor. And with pre-release events coming out this weekend, now is the perfect opportunity to talk about sealed gameplay. So in this video we'll break down the sealed format for flesh and blood and we'll talk specifically about heroes and abilities in this Uprising set that you want to keep your eye out for. So first up let's go through the heroes in the set. Dromai is a draconic illusionist hero young at 4 intellect and 20 health that says whenever you pitch a red card create an ash token. Now red cards are all cards with the red color strip on the top and you'll want to be pitching red cards so that you can create these ash tokens. Ash tokens are materials that can be used to transform into other dragons and create dragons on the board which is all what Dromai is about. You can see this when you read her second portion of text where she says if you've played a red card this turn dragons you control have go again while attacking. Essentially Dromai is looking for you to both pitch red cards and then also play red cards. You can do this on the same turn. You can pitch multiple red cards to create multiple ash tokens. You can play a single red card or more than one red card and in doing so all of your dragons gain go again. Thai is a draconic ninja hero young who has 4 intellect and 20 health as well. He says you may start the game with a phoenix flame in your graveyard. A phoenix flame is a card that you can actually bring into your sealed pool from outside of the pool that you've created by opening up six packs which is very powerful. In fact you can include multiple phoenix flames in your deck without even having to open them and the token slot. In addition to being able to start with a phoenix flame in your graveyard. Vi also says once per turn instant pay three resources. Return a phoenix flame from your graveyard to your hand. This ability costs one less for each draconic chain link you control. So with this ability, Fi can basically just go and get that Phoenix Flame at the beginning of the game if you pay three. But for each draconic attack you've made in a row, that ability gets cheaper. So if you've played three draconic attacks back to back to back, well then this once per turn instant is now free and you can just go get a Phoenix Flame from your graveyard put it into your hand and either arsenal it or play it out there and threaten more damage. Icelander is an elemental wizard hero young that has 4 intellect and 18 health, so 2 health less than the other two heroes in this set. She says Essence of Ice, which allows her to include ice cards in her deck. If it's not your turn, you may play a blue non-attack action card from your arsenal as though it were an instant. So by arsenaling a blue non-attack action card, Icelander can play that on her opponent's turn and perhaps do some tricky things. She also says whenever you play an ice card during an opponent's turn, create a frostbite token under their control. So if that blue card in your arsenal happens to also be an ice subtype card, then not only do you get to play it for the effect that it has, of course paying whatever costs are associated with the card, but you also create a frostbite token for your opponent, which is a token that sits in the field and taxes them on their next uh, play, on their next activated ability, or their next card that they end up playing. So now that we know what heroes we are going to be playing against and playing with, it's important to know what kind of cards we are going to be opening up in the set. In this set you're going to find Draconic Ninja cards, as well as Draconic Illusion Illusionist cards. These can only be played by the Ninja Phi or the Illusionist Dromai, respectively. Both of these heroes, though, can access the Draconic Talent card pool, so any card that is labeled as a Draconic card can be played by either of these. This includes the Phoenix Flame that Phi can actually start with in the graveyard. Both heroes can access Phoenix Flame, and both heroes can bring Phoenix Flame from out of the game state into the deck, even if you don't open them and sealed. You'll also be finding ice cards, the ice talent again, only accessible by Icelander. You'll also be finding elemental wizard and ice wizard cards. And yes, ice wizard cards do satisfy the requirement of creating a frostbite. By playing an ice wizard card out on your opponent's turn, they will receive a frostbite. And then of course, every hero has access to the generic card pool. Any card that is labeled generic can be played by any hero and put into any hero's deck. There's a variety of equipment in this set, some of which are generic, some of which are class specific, which you'll find of course at the bottom center. And perhaps the most important mechanic in this set, as far as equipment is concerned, 
is Quell. Quell is an incredible mechanic that says, if your hero would be dealt damage, you can pay whatever the Quell cost is. So most of the time it's Quell one. Pay Quell one to prevent one of that damage. If you do, destroy Quell at the beginning of the end phase. So if you use your Quelling robes, for example, to stop some damage, at the end phase, you'll destroy that. But if you wanted to trigger Quell more than one time, you just keep paying for it. So for example, if you get attacked by a little tiny dragon, an Aether Ashwing that comes for one, you can activate one of your Quell pieces and pay one to stop it. And then if another little dragon comes and swings at you, you can activate the same piece and stop it again by paying one. You can keep triggering the Quell on that specific piece of equipment until the end of the turn, at which point that will be destroyed and move over to your graveyard. You can also use Quell to stop arcane damage that Icelander could be throwing your way. It is a fantastic keyword and perhaps the best addition to the game from this set thus far. Okay, so we understand the heroes that we're gonna be playing with, some of the mechanics and the card types. Now let's talk about the sealed format. It's very, very simple. You will receive six packs of Uprising, which you will then open and create a pool of cards that you get to use to create your minimum 30 card deck. Now there are no rules as to how many cards you can put into the deck. If you want to include more than 30 cards, you are welcome to do so. And in fact, oftentimes I will run more than 30 cards in my decks to protect against possibly running out of cards at the end of the game, but it's really up to you. Now when building your deck, you do have to obey class restrictions. So you can't include ninja cards in your Dromai deck, for example, or Icelander cards in your Fi deck. You can, however, include more than two of a specific color and named card if you open them you don't have to follow like a blitz or classic constructed numbering system where you can only include two of a certain type of card or three of a certain type of card if you open five red rake the embers you can play all five now let's get into some of the specifics of what you're going to do once you open your sealed pool of six packs so let's say you've gone through and you've opened up your six packs of Uprising. You've cracked through those paper packs. You're like, this is incredible. Paper packs are super cool. And then you're just looking at a big stack of cards. How do you separate them? This is how I went about separating my cards in uh, sealed and uh, what I did at the end of my draft portion as well. I separated them out like this. When I did this, I separated them out first by class. So these are all of my ninja cards. It's literally just a stack of ninja cards. I separate them there. I took all of my illusionist cards and I do wanna point this out um, for ninja specifically. Uh, these ninja cards here, I separated them not by like ninja and draconic ninja. I didn't split those. I literally put them all in one stack. So if you have some ninja cards and you have some draconic ninja cards, it's just fine to put them all into one stack. You're not going to be worrying about, you know, if they're just ninja or draconic. You come with that later. Uh, separate all my draconic uh, illusionist and just illusionist cards into one stack. And then we look at all of our generic draconic cards. These are very important to take a look at. This draconic uh, little subtype, the talent card here, is very important because those cards can go into either of those heroes. So keep that in mind as you are uh, kind of separating everything out. Of course, separate out all of your wizard stuff and put all your wizard stuff in one stack. There's like three different types of cards that can go in here. And here's what I would do too. You're gonna put all your wizard actions, wizard like uh, subtype cards here. You're gonna put all of your ice subtype cards, ice wizard subtype cards, um, all of your just straight up ice actions as well. Because the only person that has access to all of these subtypes of cards is Icelander. So it's, it's just fine for you to group them all up into one big stack and take stock of what you have available to you because she's the only person that can play ice talent cards. Finally, you separate all of your cards into um, generics and I would do this in generics and then go by color. So I'd put all the reds together because both of these decks really like reds, particularly uh, Dromai because she wants to be able to play a red so that she can do stuff or pitch a red so that she can do stuff. Uh, separate them in yellows and blues. If you have yellows and blues, they they tend to fit nicely into um, Icelander because you can uh, take a blue non-attack and play it on your opponent's turn. That turns on your weapon. You also can play blues in, in any of these decks. Um, having a blue in hand for like Phi makes uh, it really easy to go three chain links far so that you can pay for something. And then uh, come in and grab a, a Draconic little uh, flame, little the old Phoenix flame, right? And then throw that down. Finally, after you separate all of these, I would very highly recommend that you put all of your Majestics 
into a different stack. Why? Why not just include these into the stack that they fit into? Like for example, why not just take Invoke Dominia and put it into this stack? Well, these can oftentimes be a signpost for you to see what you should go into or what you could more easily go into because Majestics as a higher rarity are generally more powerful cards. So keep these separate, look at what you have and see if they pull you in a specific direction. But then again, you do want to look at your equipment and equipment are things that you should very much consider consider. Um, I just pulled out two equipment. I actually had a basically a full play set of equipment for Phi. And so I ended up picking up Phi because I had multiple Majestics for Phi. I had a good stack of uh, reds for Phi and I had um, good equipment for Phi as well. Now it doesn't just stop there. You should definitely think about the composition of your deck and what each hero wants to do. Phi is an incredibly aggressive hero that just wants to push more chain links then your opponent can deal with. You can put attack after attack after attack, and if they're all draconic, snaked together, um, they're reducing the cost of his hero power. So, if you have a setup like this, you can push a lot of damage. We'll start with this setup. It's a four card setup. Three of these cards are red. One right here is blue, and this Phoenix Flame is in the graveyard. And a uh, general thing that you want to do with something like this is take and start with I don't know, like this brand with Cinderclaw, for example, costs zero, it attacks for three. It can turn something into a Draconic Chain Link, which is good, but it's literally just three go again and we don't have to pay for it. So we attack with that, our opponent does whatever they want, it doesn't really matter. We can follow up this first attack with an attack for four on the uh, Soaring Strike here. Soaring Strike deals four, it does have built-in go again and it costs us one. So we attack at that and then we pitch our blue card. That leaves us with two resources left over. As you can see, I'll just indicate that right there. There's two resources. So at this point, we've attacked for three with go again. We've attacked for four with go again and we have two resources left over. We could do one of two things. We could pay a resource at this point to use Phi's ability or we can pay two resources uh, to use the Searing Ember Blade. Uh, I like the idea of paying a resource to go get uh, the Phoenix Flame from our graveyard using Phi's ability, so we'll just kind of put it like that. Uh, paying a resource here allows us to get this Phoenix Flame, and Phoenix Flame can just come in for one. And you might be like, why, why come in for one here? Well, coming in for one and not attacking for three with the Searing Ember Blade means we have three Draconic Chain Links in a row, which is fantastic. Uh, this coming in for one, not as good as three, but it does mean that this fourth card in our hand, which is a Rupture card, Breaking Point, allows us to use the Rupture mechanic, and we have exactly one resource left, fetching the uh, card with Phi. So taking this line means that we can play Breaking Point, which costs one, it attacks for five, and if it's the fourth Chain Link or higher, then when this hits, destroy their arsenal. So we can just play that down paying one, and uh, we've pushed three, then four, and then we've gone and fetched Phoenix Flame for one, and then five. That's a way to set up a Rupture turn, and Rupture is a keyword that uh, he can take advantage of. And also, uh, Dromai can also take advantage of Rupture, because this is a Draconic action attack. She can play that as well. Dromai is all about dragons. She wants to create ash tokens by pitching red cards, and then she wants to turn those ash tokens into dragons and then throw them at your opponent. So in this sample hand, here's what we're going to start with. We're going to start with this weird yellow card called Sweeping Blow. Cost one, and it creates an ash token when you attack with it. So we're going to attack with that, but then we're going to pay this Skittering Sands, which is a red card. And when we pitch this, it will create an ash as well. So we get one ash from Sweeping Blow and one ash from pitching for Skittering Sands. So we actually have two ash on the board right now. F once our opponent deals with this two attack with Go Again, we can then come in with the craziest card, which is just a common, Rake the Embers. Rake the Embers at red meets the requirement for the red card being played. So any dragon we have will get Go Again, but it also just creates an ash and then turns our ash into dragons. Turns three of them, in fact. So we will play this, and then we will pitch a blue card, floating two resources. This gives us an ash, and then transforms all three of them into Aether Ash Wings. At which point, it is literally free to attack with these. And we can attack for one, we can attack for one, we can attack for one. Now just imagine, just imagine that we had in our arsenal this breaking point from the last example. This breaking point is a rupture. 
uh, it is a draconic attack. And if the chain link four is like when you play this chain link four or higher, then you get the rupture effect. If this was in our arsenal, we currently have two resources. We can just play this down and look, draconic chain link one, two, three, breaking point comes in for five and blows up an arsenal if it hits. So uh, sort of the same exact like ending that can be played to, but you don't have to. You have two resources. If this like was a dragon or like was uh, and you had more ash or was like a big attack and you just needed the two resources, you could play that at the end as well. There's lots of different ways that you can go about it, but here we have these little permanent ash wings that just float out there and can push damage. And finally, we have Icelander, who is perhaps the most unique of all of them, and by virtue of being a wizard, she can play on her own turn and on her opponent's turn, and we'll show you an example of that exactly. Here, we're going to start with Aether Hail, which is a one-cost, four arcane damage dealing card. Arcane damage deals uh, damage that is a lot harder to deal with because you have to bring equipment that has arcane barrier. Uh, rather than just block with cards. So we'll send four and we'll pitch uh, this blue frosting, which is literally the coolest card name, uh, which floats us two resources. So we have actually two resources left. So after our opponent deals with this four damage, we can at instant speed, we can play waning moon's effect, pay two resources and deal two arcane damage. So they have to deal with six, all for a blue and a card in our hand, which is very good. It's very efficient. And then they, after they deal with this six, I'm going to choose to arsenal this ice bolt down here. I'll even flip it up like that. And then I'll draw up and then we'll move all this stuff over. This goes to the bottom, of course, drawing all the way to four total cards. Looks like we've got some blues and some yellows here. Uh, and this is good because now on our opponent's turn at any point, if they, I don't know, play like a threatening dragon or attack with a dragon or, I don't know, send, uh, you know, like a big attack our way as Phi, we can just go into our arsenal and at instant speed at any point, play down this ice bolt, uh, paying its cost, of course. It is blue and it is an ice. So this will come across for three to any target. We, of course, have to pay for it. So we'll pitch this uh, blue card here, floating a resource but then they have to deal with three damage. Now, if this is sent um, at their face, then it's three to them, or it could be three to like an ally that they control. But by virtue of this being an ice card played on our opponent's turn, we get to give them a frostbite, which is fantastic for us and not so good for them. After they deal with this three damage, we can then follow this up again on their turn with Waning Moon paying extra resources. I don't know, let's just chuck this uh, Oh, I don't know. Arctic Incarceration. That seems fun to throw out there. And in doing so, we're not attacking for two. It's on our opponent's turn. We're attacking for three. So we present to them six damage on their own turn after presenting six damage on our turn. And we gave them a Frostbite. And we set up our own hand on our own turn with uh, a couple of different options. We can either play this Aether Ice Vein or we can just Arsenal the uh, crazily cut Arctic Incarceration. Look how weirdly off-center that is. Anyway, we throw this in the arsenal, we could play it on their turn, and then give them more disruption effects, more ice uh, just being thrown at them, and that is really what Icelander wants to do. And finally, before we wrap up, I have a giant stack of cards that I can use to show you some great options. If you see any of these cards in your sealed pool, this could perhaps pull you in the direction of said hero. So first of all, um, Phoenix Flames are fantastic for uh, Phi. I mean, that's like his bread and butter. You don't need to find these in your sealed pool. I just want to remind you that it's all kind of not centered around Phoenix Flames, but if you have enough Draconic Chain Links, you can go fetch these. So having Phoenix Flames uh, is definitely what you want to put into the deck. You get these in the token slot and you can take tokens and put them in your deck even if you don't open it so just remember to grab these and put them in your deck don't forget to include phoenix flames okay so these are the cards that you'd want to look for or maybe just like some really good cards that you'd find in fi that would lead you to him ronin renegade as a zero for three with go again basically unconditional go again super solid and it doesn't have to be the red version it can be the yellow version as well it's unconditional go again this is how you can start a chain right you start with something that has natural go again you don't have to worry about giving it go again and like uh, having your opponent stop the chain before it really gets started uh, lava vein loyalty same thing it doesn't have to be the red one but if you play this um, on the second or higher chain link and the first thing is draconic 
This is just basic go again. It's a zero for three again. So you can come in with that. Blaze Headlong, even better. It's a zero for four. And if you've played another red card this turn, this has go again. So if you come in with either of these two cards, you can follow it up with a zero for four. You don't have to pitch for any of these cards thus far. They all have go again in some way, shape or form. Rebellious Rush, again, it's a two for five. It's like a whelming gust wave and it has unconditional go again. That's what you want in cards. You want a lot of unconditional go again or zero cost unconditional go again of really just about any color. Reds are good though because they turn on effects like Blaze Headlong and other cards like that. Uh, you want to be able to set up for big finishes. Something like a Lava Burst is good, but you could even just do like three things and then go fetch a Phoenix Flame and use Phoenix Flame and maybe the equipment, the arm equipment that gives plus one, Heat Wave. Uh, but lava, Ver lava Burst is a great way to finish off a chain because it just comes in for five at the end for free. And this is fairly easy to set up if you go three attacks, grab Phoenix Flame, go for the last one. You can even go like one attack, use the weapon, you know, like pay a resource, go get the Phoenix Flame, play that, and finish with a Rupture attack. So for Dromai, this card is ridiculous. This card is so good. Rake the Embers like makes the deck. If you have multiple of these in just about any color, reds and yellows particularly, uh, you should play Dromai because it's really good. You make Ash tokens by pitching red cards, and then you play Rake the Embers, and your opponent has to spend time dealing with your dragons. And I'm just gonna say this right now. If you're playing against Dromai and they make dragons, deal with the dragons. Don't try to out aggro, deal with the dragons, okay? Because you will lose if you don't. Rake the Embers creates an Ash token and then gives you three dragons. Really good. The other way you can take Dromai is just play big things. Like this is a this is a one for four with go again, and it has Phantasm, the keyword in Illusionist that allows people to pop it with a six power. Uh, so watch out for that. But like you run these, like there's giant versions of this that attack for seven, like a two for seven. You can play that version of the deck as well. Sweeping Blow makes you an Ash. Cards that attack and make you Ash tokens are really good. Generating Ash is kind of the tricky thing, and then turning that Ash into the Dragon is really the tricky part. So finding cards that turn things into Aether Ash Wings or finding other dragons is really your ticket in Dromai. If you have like billowing mirages, like yellows and reds, uh, then you're feeling very comfortable uh, because you can take those Ash tokens you've been making and finally turn them into something. And then of course, if you have any dragons, like this dragon is nuts against Wizard. Super nuts. Uh, I've played it and had it played against me and it's super nuts. It's my spoiler card. Of course it's nuts, right? Chromai, and basically, I, I just want to point this out. All the dragons are beneficial in some way. This dragon allows you to get around the uh, I haven't played a red card thing this turn. Because it wouldn't have go again, but when you attack with it, it gains an action point so you can follow it up with something else. So deal with this card, right? Deal with this card. It deals um, damage. Like, just straight up deals damage. Two attack, and then also deals an arcane damage. And arcane's hard to deal with. So all dragons are good. If you see them, it could lead you to running Dromine. And then finally, of course, if you're playing Icelander, having red cards to play on your turn is really good. You can deal, like in this case, a two for five. Play that on your turn, and then Arsenal blue card. This is probably like the best card to Arsenal because it costs you one. It uh, draws you a card, has go again, but you don't use that. It forces uh, like a freeze effect onto your opponent, which could be beneficial, but it also allows you to float to and attack with Waning Moon. That weapon is so good. That is like one of the best weapons in the game. Waning Moon, dealing three on your opponent's turn, two on your own turn, and pitching a blue for both of those effects for this cold snap, pretty solid. It's one of the best. Polar Cap, you can also play on your opponent's turn and you can play it on your turn if you fuse it. Deals two arcane damage, but also if you fuse it, you can uh, create frostbites for them. If you're playing this on your turn, then you can create a frostbite over to their turn. If you play it on their turn, it creates a frostbite if you fused it um, as well, which is fantastic, which means it's a fine card to arsenal. And then any other ice card that you can arsenal not only does the effect, in this case, frosting costs zero, deals one damage, it also creates a frostbite. So playing that out, fantastic. And then finally, this is a super must. This card is a must. All versions of Singe are a must against Dromai. Because if you, as Icelander, get overrun by dragons and you don't have Singes, you can't catch up. Okay, you just can't deal with them. So run Singes, try to deal the one damage across the board to the opponent, 
and then to all their tiny dragons and see if you can like remove the board. So there you go. There's a quick and dirty guide on sealed format for the Uprising set. I am so pumped about this set. It is so much fun to play dragons, so much fun to do wizard stuff, and then to just go like 14 chain links with uh, Fi. Everything about this set is up my alley and I'm so pumped to actually play this some more. If you enjoyed the video and you want to uh, say thank you, feel free to make that number go to another number. As always, thanks for watching.